Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm thrilled that so many people are here already, and I see people are trickling in. So I'll give um, short opening remarks uh, to give people time to settle in um, before turning it over to the real stars of the evening, Carrie and Mia. My name is David Breslin, and I'm the Demartini Family Curator and Director of Curatorial Initiatives at the Whitney. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to this evening's edition of Ask a Curator. And everyone's in luck because we have two fantastic curators, Carrie Springer and Mia Mathias here to answer questions and um, really give you a, a overview of the great fantastic exhibition working together the photographers at the Kamonge workshop that's on view at the Whitney right now. Um, as we get started I'll quickly mention that tonight's event is being live captioned um, by our friend and colleague Anthony so if you'd like to enable this feature please click on the closed caption button um, you can find this on the bottom of your screen. Um, tonight's event will also be available on our YouTube channel. So if you want to rewatch or share it with a friend, um, please feel free to do that. I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speakers, um, both Whitney curators, Carrie Springer and Mia Mathias. Uh, they'll be sharing about the exhibition, uh, working together, the photographers of the Kamonge workshop, which opened at the museum last month. Um, I know I speak for everyone at the museum, um, all of our colleagues, and friends when I say that um, it's really a stunning exhibition and we couldn't be happier that it's at the Whitney um, because Carrie and Mia won't say it themselves because they're too polite to brag. It's absolutely beautiful. It's as kind of resonant um, as it is rigorous and really a feast to behold. So if you're able to visit, I really re recommend that you um, do so, but be sure to make your reservations for tickets in advance. Um, I'll be back a little bit later um, to host the Q&A. Um, if you'd like to submit a question, please do that using the Q&A feature, um, again, on the bottom of your Zoom uh, grid. Um, I'll try to get to as many questions as I can, but um, for now, on to the stars of the evening with huge congratulations, Carrie and Mia. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate it. Um, and good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really happy to be talking to you this evening about working together the photographers of the Kamoinge Workshop exhibition. And as David mentioned, I'm here with my great colleague, Mia Mathias, who I've had the pleasure of working with on the show. And we're going to go back and forth in talking with you about this exhibition. The show was originally organized by the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond and was curated by Dr. Sarah Eckhart, the curator, uh, associate curator of modern and contemporary art there. And the focus of the show is a collective of um, 14 black photographers. Here we go. Um, who lived in New York City and initially came together in a spirit of friendship and support. Um, in the early days, they met weekly to share their work, um, their critical perspectives, technical and professional expertise, and their friendship. And the meetings often included intense philosophical and political discussions as well. They each had very different backgrounds and experience with photography, but they shared a common purpose um, to pursue photography as an art form and to make photographs of and for the black community as they saw and experienced them um, in contrast to how they were often portrayed in art, media and popular culture at that time. Kamoinge artist Louis Draper explained their perspective when he stated, and I'm quoting, we speak of our lives as only we can. <clears throat> this exhibition covers the first two decades of the collective, which is 1962 to 19, I'm sorry, 1963 to 1982. And this is a period that coincides with the black arts movement and the civil rights movement. And the members chose the name Kamoinge, uh, which means a group of people working together in the Gikuyu language of the Kikuyu people of Kenya. The name reflects the ideal of the collective 
as well as a global perspective that the members had. Nine of the members are um, still living and Kamoingi as a collective is actually still in existence. However, the membership changed and expanded in the 1990s. And at the end of the 90s, they incorporated. So it's now known instead of the Kamoingi Workshop, it's known as Kamoingi Inc. When the Whitney decided to present this exhibition, we had photographs by only two of the Kamoya members in our permanent collection. And I started making studio visits with the living artists to get to know them and their work better. They were incredibly generous with their time, um, telling me about their work, about their own history, and about the history of the workshop in general. As a result of these visits, the museum was able to acquire um, a wonderful selection of photographs that we've incorporated into this exhibition. So the presentation at the Whitney includes photographs from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, um, from a few lenders, as well as a few works from the Whitney's permanent collection. Uh, the show is installed on the eighth floor of the uh, Whitney building. Uh, and this is an entrance to the exhibition, the, the title wall actually. And in the center is a photograph by Anthony Barboza taken in 1973, which really forms the visual introduction to the exhibition. To the right of this on the outside wall of the gallery is a video monitor that plays contemporary uh, interviews with the artist, um, with the living artist. So um, as you start to enter the gallery, you really get a sense of the artist, both in the early years in the 70s and in the present. Um, I do want to mention that our website actually has these interviews on it. And if you uh, go to the site for the exhibition and click on the individual artist, you'll be able to go to a link that will play their portion of the, the interview, their particular interview. Um, the exhibition is organized thematically uh, and each uh, section in the presentation includes all uh, works by all the artists. The first section is organized around the um, uh, idea of community, meaning the community of the artists. Um, and one of the focal points as you enter the first gallery are these wonderful individual portraits by Anthony Barboza of the 14 artists that were taken in 1972, just before the group's exhibition at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, they hang above, um, and you can see it here, this is an image from the gallery. They hang above an artist book that Anthony also made. Um, that includes um, for each spread on the left side, the individual artist portrait on the right side of the spread, um, an image, a photograph of that particular artist choosing. And um, each spread is um, bound together into a single accordion style binding. And I think of this as a really a wonderful reflection of the workshop. It clearly shows that each artist is a distinct individual, um, but they're all connected, um, connected and united in support of each other. Um, in addition to this book in the community section, as you can see in the background, uh, photographs are organized into smaller groups or or sort of suites. I like to think of them more as conversations um, between images. Many of them were taken on the street um, and they were not staged. As Kamoingi member Sean Walker said, and I'm quoting, I approach the way we approach photography was improvisational. I know what I'm going to play, but I don't know the notes I'm going to play. The photographs you'll see in this exhibition and in the exhibition uh, in the, this evening, as well as in the exhibition, were shot spontaneously. And in many cases are the result of, of really a split second impulse that was informed, as many of the artists explained to me, 
by a kind of alignment of their eyes, body, minds, and hearts. Um, I should also add that they were also informed by a, a really a keen awareness of art history, including photography. The photographs in the community sections show a wide range of people on the street, um, people working, as in this amazing photograph by Buford Smith, or resting or visiting with friends, as in this photograph by Ming Smith. Some of the photographs show people um, who are dressed up for a special occasion and also depict an incredible sense of style uh, in their dress and their gestures, as in this photograph by Sean Walker. There are images of people moving through the city um, that include details like text or marking on building walls, as in this photograph by Herman Howard called Sweet as a Peach, and you can see in the background on the wall an uh, advertisement um, that's titled Sweet as a Peach. There are a number of photographs of children playing, um, as in this photograph on the left by Calvin Wilson and on the right by Buford Smith. Um, some of the photographs uh, that depict children as this one by Herb Randall, which was shot on the Lower East Side, uh, show this group of children playing on the street in the foreground, but in the background is this really devastated environment. And you can see the contrast between the two. There are a group of photographs that are very lyrical and quiet as this work by Adger Cowens of a man walking in a snowy, on a snowy street. There are quiet interior shots like this uh, beautiful image by Ray Francis of a woman sitting at a table. And photographs that show intimate family and friends as in this image on the left by Anthony Barboza and the photograph on the right by Herb Randall. There's also a, a, um, a selection of portraits. Um, some are of the artists themselves, self-portraits, um, or of family or friends. And then we also have this wonderful group of portraits that are really very contemporary looking that are, are actually students. They're photographs of their students. Many of the Kamoyge artists uh, taught in community youth programs in Harlem uh, and Bed-Stuy, and the mentoring they did in photography uh, provided a younger generation with both the technical and philosophical knowledge that could really um, facilitate their own representations of their community. Um, and these are portraits, uh, the one on the left and in the center by Lewis Draper and on the right by Daniel Dawson. And the Kamoyge Workshop also published two portfolios, one in 1964 and one in 1965, and we're presenting a selection of prints from both portfolios. Uh, the workshop distributed these to universities, libraries, and museums. Um, ultimately placing their work in um, select institutions that had not um, yet collected their work. We're also showing a selection of exhibition announcements um, in support of the Black community and in order to address their own exclusion uh, from mainstream galleries and museums. Uh, Kamoyga members opened um, an exhibition space in what was called the Marketplace Gallery on 139th Street that they renamed the Kamoyga Workshop Gallery. Uh, they organized three exhibitions there around a particular theme and uh, were including uh, the original exhibition announcements from, from two of these shows. Um, <clears throat> institutional support for the workshop increased during the early years. And members also participated in group shows, um, including exhibitions at the County Cullen Library, 
um, at the Studio Museum in Harlem and at the International Center of Photography. And we have announcements from these exhibitions as well. So music was a very important source of inspiration for the collective and we have numerous quotes of members of the workshop talking about how this constant soundtrack at all of their meetings. Um, and I think that this section is really indicative of how the collective was, members of the collective were looking outside of visual art for source of, sources of inspiration for their photography. So we have a series of really beautiful portraits of notable musicians of the era. You'll find images of Miles Davis, of Mahalia Jackson. Um, but in addition to that, there are notable mentions throughout um, interviews with the artists where they reference Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk, and they really were looking to jazz musicians of the era as the standard of excellence and also the standard of experimentation. So in the images and the photographs in this section, you'll see how at times, and I think this Smith portrait of Sun Ra is a really great example of this, that they're actually embodying some of the qualities of the sounds that they're listening to. So Ming Smith really captures this dynamism and this fluidity and the sense of spontaneity in this portrait. And it kind of um, encapsulates his genre bending science, uh, sound. There's a central gallery in the exhibition that's devoted to works that emphasize abstract or surreal elements in these artists' work. Um, Al Fanar, one of the Komoinge artists, described long arguments that the group had um, and about, and I'm quoting, whether or not because a photographer is black, he has to deal with subjects that are germane to the black experience. Um, Fanari indicated that these debates could really never be resolved by the group. Um, rather, the individual artists develop their own unique aesthetic approach. And this section speaks specifically to some general aesthetic elements in their work, such as abstraction and surrealism. I'm sorry, it includes photographs um, such as this by Sean Walker um, that was shot in front of the Tiffany store on Fifth Avenue in New York that has strong elements of surrealism. <clears throat> and works that emphasize abstract qualities and extreme contrast of black and white. As this um, wonderful photograph by Buford Smith um, that he took in a, a park near his home uh, at that time on the Lower East Side um, during the snow. Um, he, he went there and saw this figure of a boy um, playing alone in the park and um, took this amazing photograph that has a really palpable sense of quiet. There are also photographs in this section in which light and shadow um, really emphasize the abstract qualities of the work, as in this photograph by Ming Smith. Other photographs in this section emphasize abstract elements of the body, um, like this Adric Callens photograph, beautiful Adric Callens photograph. Or within um, features of the face, as in this incredible portrait by Anthony Barboza of Grace Jones. The tight framing and precise lighting in this image um, turns, turns it into an abstraction of sorts. There are also photographs that read as purely abstract as this image of a salt pond pile by Al Fanar from 1971. Fanar took this wonderful photograph during a cross-country summer road trip with his family. Um, he saw it somewhere in the Midwest, the salt piled up. 
Um, and you can see it, it reads as purely abstract, but then if you look at the top of the image, you can see the, um, the clouds um, in the sky at the top of the image. Fanar is really best known for his abstract images. And he said, and I'm going to quote, my approach to photography has always been sort of Zen-like. Instead of going with a frame of reference, I try to go out with no ideas of what I want to do. Um, this photograph by Louis Draper is also in the, this particular section. And it also reads um, initially as a purely abstract image. It's actually a photograph of some kind of fabric hanging. However, the similarity of the form of the fabric with the hoods um, of Ku Klux Klan and the title of the photograph, which is Congressional Gathering, um, imbues what would otherwise be a, a purely abstract image with, with social connotations. So that serves as the perfect segue into the civil rights section. And the civil rights section is a really amazing um, collection of images taken during that era. It spans from 1963 through 1976. And um, I think a great quote to pull from is, or I'm paraphrasing from two quotes from interviews that we had with Danny Dawson and Jimmy Manis, is that they weren't civil rights photographers, they were doing civil rights. So I think if you start from that point, then you start to understand that because there are Black photographers who are focused on photographing Black communities, their work was inherently political. And just the collective as a whole was really embodying a lot of the qualities and the principles of that era of self-determination and self-sufficiency within communities. Um, and so you'll see that in the same way that they're engaging with the movement in their own individual ways, they're also photographing the movement with their individual styles. <clears throat> and they're very much within their communities around, in and around New York City. So you'll find these really amazing shots that capture iconic locations, um, iconic figures that were very much key to the movement. Um, but in going back to the individual style, looking to these Adric Howans images, um, this is the first of two that I'll show. And this is this really um, gorgeous overhead shot. And I think that Adric Howans' work has a very cinematic quality to it. So instead of capturing Malcolm X speaking as this icon and magnifying the one person, he's kind of gone for this overhead shot that really magnifies instead the crowd and the size of the community that has gathered to hear him speak. And I like that that kind of shifts the balance so that you're instead um, focused on the magnitude of the people and the gathering force of all of this crowd um, and all of these people have come to hear him speak. And then kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have this really beautiful image that is taken of Betty Shabazz at Malcolm X's funeral. And again, because of the proximity of these artists who are photographing within their own communities, you get these sense, the sense of intimacy at points that you wouldn't have found in um, you know, the mainstream uh, media at that time. They would be peddling a different narrative. So here you have this moment that's very quiet and very much um, a moment of grief and mourning. And in addition to photographing around New York City, the photographers were also traveling um, south within the nation. So you have this really stunning portrait of Fannie Lou Hamer taken by Louis Draper. And as well, um, you have these two images here by Herb Randall. And Herb Randall actually received a John Hay Whitney Fellowship to travel to Mississippi um, in, during what is now known as the Freedom Summer. And it was a summer that, as we know, is very much marked by tension and violence. And what we have here are these two really beautiful portraits um, of people in the community there. And drawing your attention to the image on the right, just get this really um, amazing layering of different textures here from the pine needles in the foreground 
to the pattern on this woman's dress and then the grass is kind of enveloping her and she's in this relaxed posture. She's in her own community and doing a task that's very much um, natural and known to her. So um, you have this really beautiful counterpoint to the images that maybe you would have seen in a textbook or in a newspaper at that time of these communities. And then you have these images that are taken from within the community. So it's very much from a different perspective and offers a sense of quietude. And in addition to traveling nationally, the photographers also traveled internationally and we have a really great selection. Here you'll see how we have um, kind of grouped the images actually by place and going delving a little bit closer here, um, Jimmy Manis um, traveled to Guyana and you have um, a series of portraits that were hang um, of photographs that were hanging together because he, he traveled there initially to film a documentary on the black illustrator, Tom Feelings. And he ended up being so wowed by the government support of arts there that he stayed there and lived there from 1971 to 1976 and very much embedded himself within the community. So he was building dark rooms, he was teaching classes and you get a sense of him kind of um, getting to know the place and the people there through his photographs. And there is this trend of the photographers visiting countries that had recently gained independence from colonial holds. So we also have um, a selection of photographs from Herb Robinson at this time. It was in 1973 that he visited and it was actually his first time visiting since he was a child. And Jamaica gained independence in 1962. So you're very much still in this period where um, independence is new. And um, as I mentioned before with Jimmy Manis traveling in order to film a documentary, several of the photographers were actually also filmmakers. And that is the case with Sean Walker. So he was actually in Cuba filming a documentary, Isle of Youth. And this is an image that was taken during that time. <clears throat> and here we also have an image by Anthony Barboza taken in Senegal, and that hangs with um, images by Ming Smith and Louis Draper. So you really start to get a sense of how the photographers at this time were kind of looking outside of the American context. And we, we have a quote from Danny Dawson at one point who was speaking to the fact that there's just this rising interest in looking to, into the roots of African American culture and also at times kind of seeing how different countries were supporting their artists in different ways. I wanna to mention two other um, uh, archival um, groups, groups of archival information that we have in the exhibition and cases. Um, one is this, uh, a case with the Black Photographer's Annual. This was a publication that was actually founded by Buford Smith. And many of the members, Kamoya members, were picture editors uh, for the publication. And, and all four publications actually featured a total of about 118 different black photographers, um, many of whom were Kamoya members, but many others who were not. Um, the Virginia Museum digitized these publications. And if you look on the Whitney's website for the Working Together exhibition, um, in the archive, there is an archival section. And it will take you to a page where you can actually um, look at images of, you can go through each issue and look at the individual images. And I highly recommend it. Um, it is uh, a fascinating um, group of group of photographers. Um, the show also includes a case with a newsletter um, from an organization called the International Black Photographers. This was a group that was formed by a number of Kamoya members um, who were inspired by their travels outside the country, as Mia told you about, to form a, a larger group with an international scope. Um, the group hosted dinners, um, and those dinners honored outstanding elders in Black photography. Um, we have four um, group photographs of the people who attended those dinners. Um, 
the first one in 1979 honored Roy de Clava and James van der Zee. You see that on the left and on the right, and this was the second dinner, um, they were honoring Gordon Parks and P.H. Polk. The third dinner um, honored Monetta Sleet and Chuck Stewart. And um, the fourth and last dinner in 1982 honored the Smith brothers and Richard Saunders. Um, and we'd like to end with this relatively current uh, photograph of Kamoinga members at the Virginia Museum in January for the opening of their show. It includes all the artists except for Ming Smith, who was not able to, to join. Um, and as you can see from all the images that Mia and I have shown you tonight, um, this exhibition highlights the Kamoinge artists' distinct voices as well as their collective concerns and celebrates the workshop's important place in the history of photography. The artist's self-organizing, commitment to community, and centering of Black experiences in their art is as relative to the current moment as it was in the 1960s and 70s. I hope you've enjoyed this virtual tour and that you'll come to the Whitney if you can to see the exhibition in person um, it, before it closes at the end of March. So please also go to our website, um, which has a very full representation um, of each artist's work in the exhibition, as well as information on the archival materials. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you so much, Carrie and Mia, for that really fantastic presentation. And um, we have time for some questions. So please feel free to, um, if you have one, to use the Q&A function to ask, and I'll try to get to as many as possible. But I want to start out with, with one, which is a lot of us will be experiencing this show um, only through this great um, presentations that you gave, but also the web portal that our great colleagues worked on, which is so rich. But I wanted to know what was the feeling for you two when you actually saw these objects coming out of the crate? Because we have to remember these are real physical, visceral things. And I wonder if you could speak maybe a little bit just to what uh, that's like and the quality of the photographs that really struck you. Shall I start, Mia? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, it was so exciting. I just can't tell you. I mean, we have been working um, really from digital images and both Mia and I saw the exhibition at the Virginia Museum. So we had seen that aspect of it. And of course we knew what um, the Whitney had collected. We'd seen that work in person. Um, but during um, the time that the museum was temporarily closed, we were working very hard on preparing for this exhibition with our exhibition designer and coordinators. And so to come to the museum and to install the show and actually see the works um, and placed in the galleries um, was just thrilling. Um, it was, they are so incredibly beautiful and so resonant. And um, it was like finally meeting a pen pal or something that you'd had <laughs> for a number of years and actually being able to see them in person. So it was, I just can't say how, how thrilling it was. Yeah, I'll just echo Carrie on that. I mean, I think it was very much amplified um, by the fact that we were, you know, hunkering down at home. So to go out and kind of have this um, real life experience was already so huge. But Carrie, I think you might remember there was this moment where we were halfway through hanging and I said, oh my gosh, they're, they're here. And it felt like we were in this room with everyone, all of these people that we had been kind of obsessively studying and reading about and like looking back on their notes and all of a sudden we were standing in the room with them. So I think it was extremely exciting, also very humbling. And um, yeah, just, we felt very, um, very lucky. That's great, thank you. Um, so we have a number of questions uh, that are coming in. So one that would be helpful just to kind of clarify 
um, the timing of certain things. Um, Carrie, could you speak to when the Whitney acquired um, the photographs that it has um, in the show? I believe, um, oh gosh, my sense of time has um, been distorted by this um, pandemic. But I think it was about a year and a half ago that we acquired, um, I think so. Okay. Sounds about right. I mean, we already had um, uh, works by a couple of the members, um, but, but I believe I started doing studio visits about two years ago and it was about a year and a half ago maybe. But. Fantastic, thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions that address the um, lack of women involved in uh, the workshop. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit uh, about that. Obviously the presence of Ming Smith is you know, important and looms uh, greatly in the show, but could you talk a little bit about um, that and if it's, it came up during your research? Um, <clears throat> I think, um, as I understand it, there was no um, desire to exclude women. You know, th this group started as a group of friends. And I think that it, it, it uh, the group um, came together kind of organically. Uh, and, um, and it had to do with people they were associated with. And so um, I believe that um, Ming was a, not meant to be a like, special, um, well, she is special and she was special. <laughs> um, and, um, but I think that, as I said, it wasn't an issue of exclusion to my understanding. It was really just a, a how it developed and, and Ming um, was a perfect addition to it. Um, she shared um, their concern for photography as an art form and had the, degree of seriousness um, that just worked with the group. Yeah, and just to, I, I can see the chat box as well. And I just want to emphasize that it's not at all indicative necessarily of um, the fact there were Black women photographers working at this time. And this is really just about the Kamwenge workshop. Um, and like Carrie said, I think that they came together based on a lot of personal um, relationships. So like someone would take a class with someone and then they would join the workshop and they would go through this whole rigmarole of um, the onboarding process. So we do have the presence of Ming Smith and there are not very many women who were involved in it, but that's not necessarily the case today because as Carrie also mentioned, um, Kowange Inc. is still in existence and I think that that kind of gender disparity is not the case um, anymore. Great, thank you. And there were a number of questions about that. So thanks for taking the time to um, answer that, both of you so thoughtfully. Um, another question that we have had from a couple of people is about the training of different photographers, um, whether they were all trained in a college university setting, whether they were self-taught, whether they were really you know, training each other in this collaborative way. Um, could you address that? Uh, yes, there was a real range. Um, um, Adger Cowens studied at a studied photography at a university, and um, and I would say all the photographers had a different degree of training, from very extensive to much less so. Um, but what's extraordinary is they were learning from each other. And um, many of the artists that I spoke to talked about the kind of interaction with each other as being a, a learning process that was unlike anything they could have gotten anywhere else. Um, and so I think that that um, sharing was super important. And I also think it's important to remember that um, at the time in the 60s, you know, um, photography programs were not as prevalent as they are now. I mean, it was a totally different time. And also important to remember that um, 
as much as we take for granted that photography is an art form now at that point, it wasn't widely um, seen as that. Um, I mean, it was by certain people, but not uh, across the board and not as extensively as today. Um, I, I think I would just add to that, like uh, uh, another paraphrase, pra paraphrase quote from Anthony Barboza that the workshop was his school. So there are so many um, instances of photographers within the workshop who reference this person for being amazing at like the tech, their technical abilities and teaching other people how to do that. And this person for having like, a very specific eye. Um, and so I think they were very much learning from each other um, even though they all had different backgrounds, some um, filmmaking, um, commercial photography, et cetera. I think we have time for one last question. And there have been a couple that have been wondering about the different themes and groupings of works and how that came to be, whether the artists were involved with those groupings. And in some ways, the, the differences between the, the exhibition uh, in Virginia where it originated because they have the Lewis Draper archive and at the Whitney. So that's a lot, but I'm trying to pack in a lot into the one last question that we have. Um, it's a good question. Um, the, the general themes were um, originally established by Sarah Eckhart, the curator of the exhibition. Um, uh, and uh, however, um, for the Whitney, I think the, there are some, some differences. Uh, one is we're very focused on the fact that these are artists that uh, were living in New York and that's super important. And I think that um, is very evident in our, the way we handle the material and hanging it and, and so on. Um, also at the Whitney, we have the central gallery that deals as I explained, deals more with um, issues, aesthetic issues like abstraction and surrealism. And the Virginia Museum's um, section that was somewhat similar, I think had to do with abstraction, um, reflection and shadows or something. So um, I was very much wanting to focus on, um, on in a slightly different way, um, because of conversations that I'd had with the artist um, about uh, issues like surrealism and, and um, experimental works, um, experimentation within their work and abstraction. And um, so I think ours takes a slightly different focus in that regard. Um, also, our entire layout of the exhibition is more circular. Um, and I think that that um, also adds to the sense that, um, you know, we sort of hope that people will enter through the community section and go around um, the gallery, but they could go either way. And I think it, it gives a sense that everything was happening together uh, that might be a little bit different. Uh, we also have a few less archival um, objects in our, our exhibition. And I might just add to that to say that there is, like Carrie just mentioned, there is a circular layout and there's also fluidity between these sections. So I would hope that visitors would take them as suggestions, but also recognize that these aren't hard and fast um, rules for viewing the photograph. So you may see in the civil rights section something that evokes community for you or vice versa. And so there's this kind of uh, layering effect. And even though we've kind of suggested these categories, they're not um, presented as, you think there's a, the civil rights section, the global rights section are in the same room. Um, the community section kind of encircles the portraits. Um, and so you, you can kind of take it, but, or leave it <laughs> in certain instances. Um, yeah, so they're, they're themes, but not rules. I just want to add one other thing that um, occurred to me, and that's that we also tried when possible to group works by individual artists. 
um, because it was really important um, to us that that visitors have a sense of the individual artist as who they are and what their sensibilities were. So whenever possible, and, and that happens in, in several areas of the exhibition, there are, are sort of conversations among works that are all by the same artist. Well, that's, I think, a fantastic way to end. And I just want to thank um, both of you, Carrie and Mia, for such a great presentation and to echo so many people in the Q&A who are just raving about this presentation and about the work you've done on the show. So um, thank you all for joining this evening. Um, invite all of you to see the show in person if you can, to visit whitney.org to learn more about it uh, if you're unable to or to complement your trip. And also there are a lot of more uh, public and digital programs that are being planned um, about a number of the exhibitions on view, including working together. So please go to the website or follow us on social media to learn more. Uh, thanks to everyone and Carrie and me, a biggest thanks to you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.